the microphone here. But so it will be a little here. awkward. Yeah. Uh, and who's going to go? No, no, but the, the round table, yeah, I want, no, I want these people to be over there. Because the round table will be amongst these people. I realize oh, that you said that. Okay. Um, no, in, order to have, in order to have the people speaking in order on the program, he needs the people in order. So yeah, but that doesn't matter. Do for the screen. Yeah. What is the, you're talking no, about I'm, this? I, I think, I'm thinking that the students, all of these people, should speak from there. And then we don't even have to pass the microphone around. We just leave the microphone there. Then you, have, then you waste time with people. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> Remind me again what you're doing. Yes, celebration. You know, this is probably the busiest week for us at the Center here at the Graduate Institute because we try to combine several things at the same time. So we have the ELSA Moot Court Finals, and I think some of you are judging this. Uh, very busy for all of us. We have the big WTO conference that starts tomorrow, and I know some of you are here for that as well. We take the opportunity to have the board meeting of the Journal of International Economic Law, and, and at least for me, very importantly, it's an occasion to sit together with all of the um, clinic supervisors across the Trade Lab network. Um, so welcome to all of you. Uh, since many of you are here, and since this is kind of a, a celebration year, we've been doing it, and, and I was surprised myself for almost 10 years now, uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to, to take stock of what the legal clinics have done to date, uh, what we are doing um, looking forward, and then also more substantively to discuss a bit the, the remaining issues of legal capacity building awareness amongst developing countries, NGOs, small businesses in, in this increasingly complicated field of, of international economic law. So to talk about the, the legal clinics, the Trade Lab Network, mainly will uh, kick it off, and then we'll have Jennifer Hillman um, talk also a bit about how it's done at Georgetown, which, which may be interesting, to talk more about the substantive uh, issues of legal capacity in the WTO beyond. Um, I'm really delighted that Valerie Hughes uh, is with us to speak a bit about what she considers to be uh, the remaining challenges, uh, and I'm very glad also to see that you'll be joining the Canadian leg of the Trade Lab uh, Network, so that's fantastic. And we'll have a, a round table towards the end with a diversity of people, mainly from suppliers of legal capacity, law firms, but also from the NGO world, from the missions, uh, people who have been beneficiaries of some of the legal clinics. And, and finally, last but not least, a couple of students who've done the clinics will very briefly talk a bit about um, what they've done. And all of this we have to do in an hour and a half. So <laughs> I'm sure this will... Uh, not be a problem. Just just a few words of, of history 
Um, because, of course, we within the Trade Lab network, we know how this has developed, but for some of you it may be relatively new. Um, so I used to work for the WTO many years ago and then moved into US academia at Duke Law School where legal clinical education is very common to really train students by working on a specific uh, project for, for a client or a beneficiary. I came back in 2007 and hence 10 years um, and, and wanted to introduce some of that thinking, legal clinics, uh, in Europe. And no better place than doing it here because we have brilliant students and we also have access to to WTO, to NGOs, to missions uh, to help. So in a nutshell, the, the two goals of the clinic, at least here in Geneva and I think in the entire network, is to find new methods of training our students in this field of international economic law. Training our students, at least in Geneva, but I think also in Georgetown and in the other schools, many of whom are from developing countries. So we train them by doing. The second objective is to reach out to stakeholders, beneficiaries, who otherwise do not have the, the resources to do um, capacity building or to do legal research or to examine uh, a question of dispute settlement, negotiation, compliance. So to really help stakeholders, beneficiaries that otherwise wouldn't be able to go um, to a big law firm. Now it started off with a, what we call the WTO clinic, just on the WTO. It expanded to cover also investment issues, and now you may have seen we have a call for projects for next fall. It's meant to cover international economic law, because it, it's increasingly interrelated. FTAs, WTO, also questions of tax, of finance, and clearly of, of, of investment as well. Now, the other thing that happened is it started in Geneva, but we now have seven uh, sites that in one way or another cooperate in this effort of legal clinics. Uh, Canada, so Valerie is here on behalf of the Canadian side. Uh, Jennifer is at Georgetown. At Georgetown we've been doing it for three years. Um, uh, Professor Pons is here for, for Barcelona and Alta Gracia. At Yelpo we do clinics. Um, also at Trapka, where James is from in Tanzania. Um, in India, Jindal Global Law School. They'll be with us in a moment um, online for the internal meeting. Um, and also in, in the Middle East at Qatar, where, where Mengi is, is based. So it, it started a long time ago, if, if I look back, but uh, a lot of things yeah. have happened. We've been able to train literally hundreds of students and service um, dozens of, of beneficiaries. So I'd like to, to turn the floor now to, to Mengi to give a quick overview. And I understand, since we are live streaming this, um, we need to stay close to this microphone. So if you can hand this one over. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. I'm just going to give a quick overview of the three pillars of Trade Lab. And these are the online platform, the legal clinics, and the research component. As Professor Yus uh, has just introduced, um, we are a Geneva-based NGO, and I'm going to give you a overview first of the Trade Lab platform. It's TradeLab.org, where uh, he basically has two functions. So you can dim some of the lights. It's difficult to see. Yes. Thank you. Um, so TradeLab.org basically has two major functions. The first is really to serve as a conduit of knowledge. So whenever we have a public memo that's published, we can publish it on TradeLab.org. Uh, and um, the other ways for people to communicate, both for potential beneficiaries to reach out to us to ask questions, develop projects. Um, for internal communication, we have a secure platform for students to interact, to ask questions. And to give an e example of one of the memos that we've done um, from Canada, where um, one of the clinics analyzed the uh, legal implications of Brexit on CETA. And so far, we've already have about 1,400 visits. So this is really a way for us to engage the broader public through the platform. 
And the second pillar of Trade Lab is the pro bono legal clinics. Now we have seven sites uh, in nine schools. And how does legal clinics work? So it is triggered by a question from the beneficiary, which could be a government entity, international organization, NGO, SMEs, or business association. They reach out to us, um, either through academic supervisors or the platform, and we design a project with the beneficiary. It is supervised by an academic supervisor, and we have mentors. There are usually one to three of them for each project that supervise the students to do a final output. <coughs> the final output could be in the form of a legal memo. It could be a draft or model legislation. It could be amicus brief or third party submissions. And these is, this is the list of ac academic supervisors. And for mentors, we have legal professionals in law firms, national international organizations who are very experienced in the field. We reach out to them for each project. They give lectures at the beginning of the, um, the clinic and a lot of them continuously supervise, help the supervisor you know, give comments and feedbacks to drafts, to memos before we give it out to a uh, beneficiary at the end. In terms of the beneficiaries that we've had, we've really made an effort to diversify, engage different stakeholders. As you can see, throughout the last 10 years from all seven clinics, we've had 82 projects. And it is now very heavily governmental and NGO focused, but we also have a number of international organizations, business associations, and SMEs. To give you an idea of who have worked in the past, and bear in mind some of these projects are confidential, um, we've worked with you know, Mexico on whether it should join the ICSID, and we're also mm -hmm. working with another government on the ratification of ICSID at another clinic right now. Um, so these are some of the beneficiaries that we've worked in the past. And in terms of the students, you know, the, the whole idea of capacity building, a major part of that is to train the people as human development. Um, so for the last year out of the seven clinics, we, this is a breakdown of student nationalities for last year. So we, we have in total 49 entries and it's fairly evenly spread out um, amongst continents and we have more students from developing countries than developed countries. In terms of output, there are four major types of projects that we do. Um, there is information where we do research and analyze different things. We help with negotiation. So for last semester, for instance, two of the clinics have worked with missions here in Geneva in preparation of the um, ministerial conference that's going to happen later this year. Uh, we've done compliance work and litigation. And the last pillar of um, Trade Lab is research. We engage different academics and students to really look at broader issues, sometimes outside of the clinical component. We have a few more articles that are forthcoming. Um, some of them focus specifically on capacity building, but there are more broader issues in international economic law. We also have an ebook that's coming up. It's um, it focuses very specifically on capacity building, which has basically two sectors. One is a more general overview of different aspects of international trade and investment, such as negotiation or dispute settlement. And we have the second part, that's the case study, looking at different regions and how they have developed their capacity over time. So this is a um, comprehensive way of looking at Trade Lab to look at you know, different stakeholders, how do they interact, this is the Trade Lab platform, the clinics, research component, and how different stakeholders work, out, work with each other.
So w the next panel uh, will be, um, we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, Jennifer and Valerie to be with us for the next panel. Um, you know, out of all the very distinguishing aspects of their careers, there are two that really stand out. One is that they are really experts in international economic law. Jennifer was an, a former appellate body member, and Valerie was former director of appellate body secretariat and legal affairs division. And secondly, they are passionately dedicated to capacity building and have chosen to be academic supervisors of our legal clinics. So. Um, I will first direct questions to Valerie to uh, discuss more generally, you know, discreetly and prescriptly, one, what do you see as capacity, capacity constraints and capacity building in general? What are the current efforts that um, we have and what do you see are the places that are lacking and we should continue to work on? Please. Sorry. Really sorry. If you can put that, uh, you don't have a pocket. I'll hold it. Or in the, in the pocket. I can hold it? So, yeah, but I don't want to disturb you with that. You can eventually That's put okay. in the pocket. That's okay. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, Yost and Mengi for the invitation. It's really a, a thrill for me to be participating in this because I'm only starting into the trade lab world, and so it's a real delight to be, uh, to be here. In terms of my impressions of capacity building, you know, I think if you'd asked me to speak about this maybe 15 years ago, I would have had a different answer. I would have told you that, you know, legal capacity has something to do with uh, what happened when I was involved in a case developed country versus a, another developed country, and after that other developed country lost the case, they decided to establish their own dedicated group of trade lawyers to do the litigation. So that was their building of capacity in that developed country. I might al also have spoken about how we received a notice uh, of appeal at one point from a member in the form of a diplomatic note showing that they didn't know how it was meant to be done. This is what they were used to in international relations, and they submitted a diplomatic note instead of the normal thing. And this would uh, speak to a lack of capacity or awareness about how it's done. Fifteen years ago, I might have also told you about how a, a, a particular council for a, for a developed country, a large developed country, broke down in tears after some, you know, some fairly uh, difficult questioning by the appellate body. And let me say that this man, because I know what you're thinking, <laughs> let me say that this man, um, you know, probably was a very able lawyer, but he hadn't really been subject to that kind of intense questioning by the appellate body. So I think 15 years ago I would have given a different picture of what legal capacity is than if you asked me today. Today we're talking about legal capacity of an entirely different order, because we know that dispute settlement is of an entirely different order now. We're not talking about a claim or two in a case. We're talking about multiple claims in a case. We're not talking about, like it was in the first few years of WTO dispute settlement, maybe five third parties at most. Now if you have less than 10, that's unusual. So you have all these submissions to deal with. You have a lot more volume. And then, of course, the volume of the submissions themselves from the complainants and respondents are huge. And they have to take into account an ever-growing volume of law that the appellate body is churning out on a regular basis in, in reports that are really difficult for most people, even most trade lawyers, to get through. They're huge, they're opaque, they're sometimes very difficult to read, and they really do require a lot of legal knowledge. So I think the legal order has changed quite a bit in terms of what capacity means. And we know that over the years, the WTO has all kinds of training programs. They go out and train government lawyers, and I think they do a great job doing it. But to sit, sit in front of a group and tell them how it's done by sort of going through the rule book, it's not really going to build a lot of capacity. Some knowledge, of course. But really, you need to see it done. You need to do it yourself. And I think that that's why I encourage, when I do some training, 
that the governments participate as third parties because you get to watch. It's a, an enormous learning experience. It might be a bit expensive. That's true. You have to send someone. But if you have a mission here, at least you could send the person from your mission. It is a, it is a, a way of learning that, that teaching someone at the front of the room just won't accomplish. So what Trade Lab, the way Trade Lab works, of getting students involved in real work, actual stuff, doing a real question, not listening to someone tell you how it's done, but actually doing the work, doing the research, coming up with the answers, figuring out what the answer is to a real question. That's showing you how it's done. I was asked to speak to, for only a couple of minutes, so I'm going to end now, with this reminder for you of that proverb. And I looked, tried to find out where it came from, and there's too many different answers. But remember that what they say, huh? If you give a person a fish, they won't go hungry, hungry today. If you show them how to fish, they'll never be hungry again. That's what trade lobby is. Thank you. Somewhere. Yeah, I can hang on to it. Okay, Thank and I just realized these notes went blank. Um, so I will speak without them. All right, so thank you. It is also my real great honor to be here today and to look around the room and see lots of uh, familiar faces and some new ones to me and to tell you a little bit about the story of how Trade Lab sort of works at Georgetown and how I see what it does to build capacity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what it does to build capacity on the student side and then what it does to build capacity among the beneficiaries, because I think both um, have been really benefited from Trade Lab. Let me start first with the students, in terms of how do we build um, capacity, I would say, among the students. And what's interesting to me when I read the course evaluations of the Trade Lab at, at Georgetown, everybody has to fill out pretty detailed course evaluations, and I would say almost universally, every single student says that the Trade Lab was the single most important and best thing that they did in their entire time at Georgetown. And we sort of push them on why. Why is it, um, in your view, the best thing you did at Georgetown? And almost all of them sort of come up with three reasons why they thought it was so important to them. First, it is that it trained them with skills, again, as, as Valerie is saying, that you cannot get in a classroom. So it's very clear that they're picking up on the fact that learning by doing is, is not only more beneficial to them, but it lives with them, that they really do remember what it means um, to do this project because they've lived it. Um, secondly, it really is a learning experience for the students because it teaches them a lot of what you would learn in a traditional clinic in the sense of it teaches them how to relate to a client, how to hear a client, um, speak about what their needs are when many of the clients don't really know what their needs are. Um, they don't, are not going to be articulate in a trade law kind of a way about what is it that we need. Um, and so they have really had to learn how to listen um, to their clients and learn from them and realize that this is a partnership um, between them and a client. And for a lot of them, that is a really critical skill. Um, and I would say the last thing that at least at Georgetown really distinguishes um, the practicum from a, a clinic. Obviously, we at Georgetown, like many of the American law schools, run lots of clinics. This is very different for the students from a traditional clinic because they learn so much knowledge across all of the projects that are the subject of a given clinic. Um, and that's part of the way in which we structure the program. So for us, we, this semester, for example, we had six beneficiaries. Um, so we put together six teams of three students that were responsible for, for handling each individual project. However, each student was also assigned to be a shadower for a second project. So each student came out with, I would say, extraordinarily deep knowledge of the project on which they worked. And they were also came out with I would say reasonably deep knowledge in the area in which they shadowed because they were required to comment substantively on every written submission of the project that they were just shadowing. 
So even though it wasn't their own, they were very much involved in the substance of two projects. Um, and, and that, again, was very important to them. The other part of the reason why students say they come out of this with so much more than they would get from a clinic um, is because of both the research component to it and the mentoring, expert me mentoring program. So again, at Georgetown, I would say in class number three, uh, it, uh, or maybe it's four, um, we bring in uh, the head of our international law library who has tailor-made a research program for each of the various clinics. So again, if one of the clinics is going to be very involved in looking up, as this one was this past year, um, every anti-dumping or countervailing duty or safeguard measure issued in a number of countries, um, you had to be able to look up what is the law. So again, the, the question comes, can you look up foreign law? Do you know how right now to find what is the contract law of Uganda? How do you do that? Where do you go? How do you, et cetera. So every student comes out, I think, with very good knowledge of how to research foreign law as well as international law, as well as international trade law. So they're all given a very dedicated research program and sort of help at the library to really make sure they're getting the resources that they need. The other big component of it then is these experts. And again, it's, it's a broad ray. I mean, two, two years ago, um, one of the projects was literally write a tariff schedule um, for a least developing country that literally did not have the capacity to write a tariff schedule. So who do I bring in as the expert in that case? The head of the United States International Trade Commission's Tariff Affairs Office, who has spent 40 years writing tariff nomenclature, who can really walk through how do you think about tariff nomenclature? Why is it described in this way? What is the relationship between the harmonized tariff system, you know, et cetera, and what they're looking at coming in from this country? So that expert is basically sitting with them time and time again to try to provide that kind of expertise and is delivering an overall lecture to the whole class so that everyone in the class, even if that wasn't your project, even if you weren't shadowing that project, you nonetheless had a really engaging discussion with an absolute expert in the world on the tariff schedule um, and how to develop and write a tariff schedule from that person. So we make great use of our experts um, in a way that I think is, is, again, really unique and not something that you would have in a normal clinic where it's simply you going and helping one client and you really don't have this collective sort of pool of expertise, et cetera. Um, obviously, the other things that students clearly learn is teamwork. Uh, I mean, we try um, to the extent that it's appropriate to say to the team, you're going to be graded as a team. Uh, you're all going to get the same grade. So there's a real effort to say you need to work together. Um, this cannot be, you know, just sort of my piece of the memo is this. My part of the project is that. You have to learn to work as a team. And again, you have to learn to figure out quickly what's the best skill set to draw on from each member of the team in order to come out, again, with a team project. So I, I think for the students, it is really an incredible ability to really put trade law into action. And the sort of, obviously, the last thing for the students that they get out of it, I think, is the just really good feeling that they've really helped very needy beneficiaries who simply could not afford uh, to pay for the kind of legal advice, and technically not advice, I'm sorry, to pay for the sort of uh, information that they're getting from it. Again, we are, we are very clear to disclaim on everything that we are not providing legal advice because these are students, um, and we try, I, I slip a lot, um, to not refer to them as clients, they are beneficiaries. Um, but nonetheless, I think the students feel very good about their ability to help um, those that could really use this kind of help. So on the student side, I think there's a, just a tremendous amount of capacity building that students walk out of this experience really confident in their ability to, to solve and to address a trade problem. Then if I think about the capacity building on the client side, on the beneficiary side, I mean, what do they learn from it? There, I think it's a, an incredible range of what do they take away from it. Um, and part of it depends on sort of what was the project in the first place and what was their level of knowledge. And for many of them, they're starting fairly close to ground zero in terms of their, their, their knowledge. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, two years ago, one of the projects we did was for the Secretariat for the CARICOM. So this is all the Caribbean islands. All right? So they're well aware that they're all members of the United Nations, and they're well aware that United Nations Security Council resolutions are binding on them, mandatory. 
They're actually, some of them are well aware of UN Security Council Resolution 1540 that says you may not trade or be a transit point for biological, nuclear, or chemical weapons. But in terms of knowledge, you can stop right there. So their reaction is, how? How am I supposed to stop the transit of biological weapons across Haiti, across Jamaica? I mean, I have no idea. I don't, I don't even know what subject matter I'm talking about in terms of thinking about this. I know I want to do it. I, Jamaica, I would like to say that I'm in compliance with my UN resolutions, but I have no idea how to do this. So again, this is a client that is starting fairly close to ground zero, where the students have to come in and explain how does an export control system work. How do you develop a list of controlled persons that you're going to control who can move anything in or out of Jamaica or Haiti because they're on a controlled list? How do you create a controlled list of chemicals that are, on the one hand, used for fertilizer, and on the other hand, used for bombs? I mean, how do you do that? Um, and then how do you develop both a legislation and a regulatory process that will do that? So in that instance, you're bringing the client from a very low level, and by the end of it, um, it was to the point where Jamaica said, we're prepared to enact this. I mean, we're prepared to enact the law as the students wrote it because we've been through this iterative process. We understand that we need to do this. We understand that if we did this, we would then be in compliance with our obligations. And, uh, you know, again, and actually from that, they could then potentially get aid to help them in the, in the formal implementation of, of, uh, of the project. So for some clients, that's where you are. I mean, another client, for example, here, a member of the WTO, but again, one of the many WTO missions in which the ambassador is also doing ILO and UNCTAD and UN and UNHCR and on, 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 um, and came here with great knowledge of some of those missions, but very little on trade. And his government enacted a number of fairly WTO inconsistent measures, um, and he comes into all these WTO meetings and feels like he's being literally set upon because he doesn't have a good answer for question, 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 why did you do this? Why did you do this? How do you justify this? What? Again, so starting from a pretty low base, and over time, the students were able to, on the one hand, help him craft. So what should he say in the general council meeting? I mean, what should he say about these measures? What should he say in the Council on Trade and Goods? What should he say in the Council on Trade and Services? How can you justify, or at least explain to the rest of the world, why did your government do this? And where, if at all, is there grounding in WTO law as a justification for it? And at the same time, the students were able to say, you know, you could tweak your legislation here, 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 and here, and make it much less WTO inconsistent, um, and still more or less meet the goals that you were trying for in the first place. So again, the clients have learned, uh, or the beneficiaries have sort of developed their capacity to say that there are WTO consistent ways to do things, there are WTO inconsistent ways, I can learn which is which, I can make adjustments on the fly, etc. And you see over the course of the semester, particularly with the client, with the beneficiaries, I think that are starting at this lower level of knowledge, this trust start to grow, um, where they start to believe that the students come at this from a completely neutral standpoint. The students are not biased one way or another, they're not coming from any particular perspective, they're not trying to push an American view or an any other view, they're simply trying to address the genuine needs of these beneficiaries. And as a result, I, I think the beneficiaries are really upping their learning curve um, in terms of their own understanding of whether it's WTO law or investment law um, or and, and the sort of policy and politics that go along with it. So, my, my own sense is it's really been an, uh, an amazing journey for the students in terms of where they start from. I think Yost and I can both attest. I mean, you read the first draft and many times you really shudder of how are we ever going to get um, this project over to the finish line. And then you look at what you get in that last submission and honestly you stand back and say, wow, wow. You know, they've come from, but the students and the beneficiaries have come from you know, sort of a fairly you know, low point to really very well crafted, very well analyzed, and again, for even from the beneficiary standpoint, a real confidence that they can move forward. I mean, again, in this one case, um, this ambassador literally read word for word um, what uh, the students drafted for them and received such positive feedback from the other members of the WTO. Thank you so much. Now we understand. I understand. I, I hear you. I appreciate where you're coming from. I had never understood this before. 
So the ambassador then feels very good that he's, that he's delivered a statement that was well crafted, well positioned, and he came out of the whole experience feeling much better. And for my students, it was an amazing experience. And then to get a little call from him thanking them for their work, really, again, it's that in the end of the day, the students walked out not only with the knowledge, but with the thanks um, of a beneficiary who was grateful for the work that they had done. So I think across both and all, um, it really does work to build a, a huge amount. And sort of over the years, when I think of how many beneficiaries and how many students will have walked through this process, um, we will have done an amazing amount of capacity building sort of throughout the world. So I, I think it's, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful journey, and I, and I want to really applaud Yost for his brilliance in coming up with this concept and idea and for sort of seeing it through these years uh, because, and, and we're certainly not even close to done because there's way more work out there to be done, um, but, but I, I really think it's been a, a totally worthwhile experience from all, all of those engaged. Um, for those of you that have not really been engaged or for those sitting around, again, we're always looking for expert mentors, so if that sounds really interesting and appealing, again, we really are looking forward to hearing from you. Um, for those of you that might have suggestions for other beneficiaries that could use this kind of work, that's the other thing that we're always, um, that we're always um, open for. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have a few minutes for uh, questions directed both at Valerie and Jennifer. It's not a shy group. The WTO training and then the issue of third party rights participation. And I think looking at it from our perspective, because I'm coming from the Nigeria mission, Nigeria, uh, Nigeria Trade Office to WTO. So I'm a delegate. And uh, looking at the training generally, because you have the technical assistance, but there are certain concerns, at least, coming from me as a person, not as a Nigerian delegate now. Because when you look at it, training is done, people fly into capitals, read out the WTO law, and then come back. And I don't see that as that much helpful, but these clinics are much more important. So I believe not only looking at engaging government officials, but trying to see how you could look at African universities, <coughs> try to see how you can collaborate with them, help them draw up their curriculum, and see how that could also be replicated and assist them. Regarding third-party rights participation, because presently Nigeria is a third party in the, in the Australia tobacco dispute, of course, taking that decision alone was much more difficult than even participating as a third party because it took the intervention approval from the president for us to participate because you are talking of dispute and then there is that issue of, oh, perhaps if I antagonize Australia, a big country, that could be one problem or the other. So certainly we got that approval, but every, the rest of the thing were done here in the mission and we are grateful because we have talked to other people, not only within the sectariat, because sectariat is supposed to be impartial, but we have had some few conversations that are helpful, especially in the terrace mm -hmm. at the lake site. So we didn't discuss it in the sectariat. <laughs> and I think that has proved to be useful in preparing our third party submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, just a general question. Uh, uh, maybe I, other team members can, can assist. The concept of law clinics, uh, I'm Amos Saurombe from the University of South Africa. Um, the concept of law clinics has been working very well for us for 
undergraduate courses, uh, uh, criminal law mostly, especially in assistance of uh, mostly disadvantaged communities, uh, representing them and so on. But our challenge has always been, I want to draw parallels here, uh, the, the capacity in terms of uh, uh, how do we define who deserves uh, this kind of service because we find ourselves having to deal with a lot of uh, uh, applicants wanting to do the same. It may be different at this level, but we find that at times the quality of service uh, also gets compromised if we have got an avalanche of uh, uh, those requesting assistance. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of approach has been used uh, in these clinics to make sure that um, you have got capacity to provide the, the, the assistance, but also quality uh, assured uh, 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 processes and also ultimately service uh, for those who, receives, uh, who receive it. But also maybe uh, I like the concept of uh, uh, you, you teach somebody how to fish, but also make that fisherman also a teacher of the next generation of fishermen. Thank you. On quality, I, I, I only give you a little response in that um, there, I do think there is a big burden on the academic supervisors. Um, so um, at least, again, at least at Georgetown, um, obviously some of the quality burden falls on our expert mentors. Um, and we really do try to choose ones that have themselves a great deal of expertise and encourage them to stay up with all the drafts and the iterations and give substantive feedback, not just style or, or writing feedback, but at the end of the day, um, the quality control, if you will, falls on the academic supervisor. So Yost and I bear a lot of that burden in Georgetown. Others I see from Yelpo and elsewhere um, bear that burden in their own institutions. Um, it will never be perfect, but I would like to believe that we've really worked very hard um, at feeling very confident that what comes out in that final product is at least substantively correct um, and something that we are at least prepared to put implicitly, again, it's not our names on any of these documents, it's our students' names, as it should be. Um, so my name will not appear on anything, but I will tell you I, have, I won't let it go out unless I'm at least confident myself um, that the end bottom line interpretations are, in my judgment, correct. So at some level, you're putting your faith in those that serve as the academic supervisors. Um, and that may be a weak link in the program. I, I want, like to think not, um, but I'm not sure there's any better way to try to put this together without trying to just constantly work at having as much supervision as we can. You know, I, I would say as well, Deborah Steger, who has been running the clinic at the University of Ottawa, that Queen's University, where I'm going to be, will be joining. She has also talked about, you know, the challenge of being the academic supervisor and the, the volume of work and the, you know, the challenge of making sure that you're providing the assistance that the students need over such a short period of time because it's in one term. So it is a challenge, but in, again, I think it is a real dedication on the part of the academic supervisor, but also a learning experience for the academic supervisor. So the, the, the learning goes both ways in that, and that's part of what I see uh, I'm going to be participating in as well. So that, I think, is a problem that we're going to run into. I think it is a good problem to have too much work um, in the clinics. Uh, but as you know, Ottawa U and, and Queen's now combining you know, so that we can do more, um, that's, that's a good sign, I think. So you broaden the, you know, the, the reach by, by having the two universities collaborate now. all walked out of the clinics with the confidence to tackle very difficult questions. So um, we will have Irina speak first, and then Yvonne and Aditi. Can you just introduce yourself, where you're from, and then the project? Thank you. Um, yeah. Just add that. Perfect. Uh, thank you. 
Um, my name is Irina Kiku. Uh, I'm from Moldova and I'm a Master in International Law uh, uh, candidate at the Institute here. Uh, next, uh, last, uh, last semester I had the honor to work on an interesting project with the other two fellow um, uh, students from the Institute. Our project um, aimed at assisting a developing country to formulate a negotiation position regarding the ongoing fisheries subsidies uh, negotiations at the multilateral level. So uh, our uh, project was focused on two areas. First of all, we had to come up with um, determining the, the major, major uh, definitions, the main definitions uh, in the WTO negotiations of fishery subsidies. And second of all, we had to deal with a specific negotiations framework, which out of uh, confidentiality reasons I cannot talk about, but I'll focus on the first part which was on the, on, the key, on the key terms. Those terms are illegal and reported and unregulated fishing. That is uh, overfishing, overcapacity, and artisanal fishing. So uh, these four terms, for all of them, we went through the, all the definitions we can find in, uh, in different documents. We tried to analyze the components of, this of these definitions, and then we tried to relate these definitions to the subsidies, disciplines that are there, or the ones which uh, members are trying to develop at this stage. Uh, the key concerns we took in consideration uh, is that the need to, to enhance sustainability of the fishing activities in high seas and in exclusive economic zones. We, we looked at the sustainable development uh, goal number 14.6 and we basically supported a lot the prohibition of uh, subsidies that uh, enhance IEU fishing, overcapacity, overfishing. So, uh, into the process of, uh, of this analysis, we looked at a few uh, key documents that throughout these years, to, from uh, roughly 2001, since Doha um, uh, negotiations started till now, informed these uh, negotiations on fisheries subsidies. And um, these documents are uh, 2007 chair text on um, and here we have uh, the approach of uh, major prohibition of uh, fisheries subsidies, but then there are a few exceptions, especially relating to special needs of developing countries. Then we look at 2011 uh, chair's report, then at the T TPP uh, agreement, but then again I have to stress out that we looked at it as a model, as a, as a model that could have an impact on the further negotiations, for example, the countries that uh, are involved, uh, were involved at the stage uh, on the TPP, uh, how they probably would push for the for the um, having the same outcome, a same outcome in the further negotiations. So um, and some other documents, and uh, of course the findings that we have um, are bo basically mostly beneficiary oriented again. But uh, some of the very general ones are, for example, uh, the IUU fishing. Um, there's a wide agreement among members that IUU subsidies shall be prohibited. And uh, I must stress out that negotiations that on this area are the most advanced all of the, out of the, all the other, other um, negotiations on the other terms. Uh, overcapacity, members can't really agree on it yet. Uh, it's a very contradictory term. Uh, and there's a lot of different subsidies that different members consider as contributing to overcapacity. So again, um, Negotiations are really uh, not that advanced in this area, but it's a very interesting term, as in the sense that it's very contradictory. Uh, overfishing uh, is related to the maximum sustainable yield, <coughs> sorry, which refers to the highest possible catch, uh, in a sense that to have uh, the stock still sustainable over the time. Um, and last, artisanal fishing, which is a term that, again, many developing countries especially are uh, interested in. And it refers to the, basically the suppliance of the needs of the consumers locally. Uh, so uh, time-wise, I cannot take questions, but uh, I'll be very glad to discuss it further with those interested in it. And our MIMO, is uh, the public part of it, uh, is uh, on the Trade Lab platform. So please feel free to access it and direct questions to us. We'll be happy to, to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Help. Maybe no, I don't think uh, it's uh, here inside. Thank you very much. So 
So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ivan Rananga. I'm a, a second uh, year student here in Masters of International Law as well. And I'm from Burundi. So first of all, I'd like to thank Treadlab for uh, giving us the opportunity to discuss our project. Um, I also worked on a confidential project, so I won't be able to go into the details and put names. So in terms of the project itself, we were mandated by an NGO that is based and operates in, uh, in uh, developing countries, in, uh, in, in one, one specific developing country in uh, Southeast Asia. And basically what we were asked were to come up with corporate models that could be used for, uh, purpose, for uh, economic and development purposes for the, be for the benefit of one identified community that had been historically marginalized economically and, uh, and uh, socially. So in simple terms, we were to come up with models to, uh, that would allow for revenues that were being generated from uh, uh, development projects, resource development projects in the areas where this, commu this community was located, for those rev revenues to be kept in, that, in those communities and be used for the welfare and betterment. So how did we go about this? We of course looked at how similar projects were undertaken and carried out with regards to communities that were in similar conditions. And in, in this respect, uh, there were a lot of work and uh, studies that were conducted by the World Bank, which were very, very relevant and very helpful. So in the end, we narrowed our proposal to three corporate models. One was a sovereign wealth fund, because it had been pointed to us that uh, this uh, community was aspiring to have uh, some sort of uh, semi-autonomous status. So a sovereign wealth fund would be, some, would be a forward-looking uh, model that they could use in, in, uh, in the event that they achieve their status. The other model will, uh, was uh, trust and foundations. While they have been uh, frequently used as, uh, as, as, as entities to hold revenues, especially for marginalized communities, and here we have Canada among other nations that serves as a good examples with the First Nation Trust. And uh, we also identified why one particular uh, type of uh, corporate model, that is the community interest uh, companies. What is very appealing about this uh, model is that it acts as a, as a standard uh, corporation. It engages in commercial activities, but at the same time is also legally required to have a social purpose, meaning that a certain amount of, uh, of the dividend will have to be put to, uh, will have to be used for uh, social purposes. And there's uh, what is called an asset lock feature that ensures that the, 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 the assets of the companies are used for social purposes. So um, we, in each of these, uh, in each of these uh, models that we identified, we try to highlight and uh, uh, we first pointed to the pros and cons of each of these uh, models, and then we assess them against the, the very specific needs of the community that we're dealing with. And on this basis, we're able to uh, come up with a recommendation as to which, as to which model would be suitable for this particular community and uh, what might be the uh, adaptation that will be required for this model to be implemented. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the paper is also um, available, the public version of the paper is also available on, uh, on the website, so if you, have, if you are interested, you can have a look. Um, I also prepared a few, I just wanted to talk about a few things that I found were very interesting during this whole experience, and then when Mrs. Hillman were discussing it, I felt like she was reading my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing that I liked about this was the fact that it was a real case. So the fact that we were working on something that could potentially affect people's lives positively was something that was very encouraging and very uh, inspiring, and, keep, and it would keep us very motivated. Secondly, is, is the exposure through the interaction that we've had to, uh, that we had to, that we had with the, with the mentors and supervisors. We've spoken to people ranging from diplomats, from very reputable uh, academics, people who were the best in the field. And last but not least, it helped us expand our knowledge base in the sense that we got to work on this, we got to touch upon disciplines that we were not particularly familiar with, and then we were had to come at it from different angles and different perspectives. So that's about it for our project.
just add that to you? Like that? You don't have any pocket. No, I can hold it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aditi Vergis, and I'm from India. And I was part of the clinic team in 2015 while I was still a student here. So um, our team prepared a legal memorandum for a uh, WTO trade remedies case. And our beneficiary was a small firm who had no prior experience with the WTO dispute settlement system, um, but was representing a developing country member. So um, we started with the panel request. That was our point of departure, uh, so to speak. And based on that panel request, we identified the issues. And for each issue, we identified the, the rule and um, relevant case law, um, applied that rule to the, the facts of the case, and came up with our conclusions. And additionally, we also talked about how um, strong we thought each argument was and what the likelihood of success for that particular argument was. So um, I'll focus a little bit on what I saw as the main uh, points of, of uh, advantage for both the beneficiary and for the students. Um, and again, I think Ms. Hillman's uh, done a very good job of, of talking about that. From the beneficiary's point of view, um, first and foremost, I think they save time and effort and resources. And when you're a one-person law firm, that's a really big deal. Uh, secondly, you have a, a valuable and vetted input at a critical point of, of your legal dispute of your case. Um, and Professor Palin and Chuck Wu, who was our teaching assistant for that year, um, did very thorough checks of everything that we submitted. We had three rounds of drafts that were submitted before we came up with our final product, which every party was, was satisfied with. Um, and uh, finally, I think the other thing to note is that the organizers spend a lot of time and energy making sure that they have the right student for each project. So in our case, um, two people on our team had previously practiced trade remedies law at the national level in their home countries. Um, and from the student's point of view, maybe three points that I would bring up from my perspective that, would, um, that I took away from the clinic. First of all, um, I really value the chance to interact with professionals in the trade field. So for instance, um, with us, we ha our team had a one-on-one -on -one session with Mr. Nal Mika from ACWL. Um, which really allowed us to work through some of the substantive questions we had on the topic. Uh, secondly, the exercise was, a, was um, useful in sharpening our legal uh, analysis skills, our um, oral presentation skills, and general legal research skills. And we got personalized feedback. So after that first draft that we submitted, um, the one of the main bits of feedback was that we needed to structure our arguments better, and um, I know I'll never make that mistake again. So, it, so that was, it's really invaluable to get that level of detailed, spe specific feedback to your work. Um, and lastly, uh, it was just the chance to work with very motivated uh, peers from different cultural and legal backgrounds with often very different working styles and just making sure that you can work together within strict deadlines to produce a product that you can be proud of. Um, and on a lighter note, where the three of us are really good friends now, and uh, I met them recently. Uh, so on the whole, I think just um, this is a project that uh, has beneficiaries all around. Thank you. they have experienced this. So I, I'd like to turn now, and you, this is a small group. We can talk about this informally, <coughs> although we are being live streamed on the internet. Um, <laughs> by the way, thank you for doing this. And I'm sorry you have to walk around yeah, with the mic. Exactly. But uh, I think we can leave it here now. Everyone, at least on the round table, is close enough to me. So if we speak up, it should be OK. Um, to, to really go to the, the substantive issue of um, Capacity building, I think often it's, it's about awareness. Someone mentioned they don't even, some of the beneficiaries don't even know what question to ask, let alone answering the question. So to think a bit about uh, where we stand today and what are still some of the gaps out there. And we really have a, a stellar group of people to, to help us with this. Um, Scott Anderson, a partner with Sidley, um, they have a pro bono project uh, that you may want to, to speak a bit about. And they have been one of the... Um, 
core suppliers, if I can call it that way, of, of mentors, especially in Washington. Uh, people have, have really helped um, uh, practicum team, teams there. Lisbeth Kazir has been a student here at the Institute, but now works for the IISD, which has been a beneficiary a while back um, of one of a Geneva-based um, projects. Said um, El Hachimi from the WTO Secretariat, who has been very instrumental helping us set up the clinic in Qatar, and who was also there in the Middle East with us to, to build the clinic uh, in that region. Thea Lee, uh, great you can be with us. I, I don't think you have any prior contact with, with the Trade Lab, but of course you're the Deputy Chief of Staff of the AFL-CIO, the biggest trade union in the US, so there as well to hear a bit from you on, on stakeholder engagement. Um, Tokazani Nguira from um, Trapka, which is another partner in the trade lab, trade lab network. He has been an academic supervisor, especially for projects in, in Africa. Uh, Fernando Pierola, who of course is with the advisory center, and Aditi just mentioned that they as well have been really helpful coming over to give talks, presentations to some of the student groups. And finally, Mauricio um, Salcedo from the Colombian mission, um, <coughs> who has uh, submitted some projects uh, to the trade lab. Okay, we've been talking a bit before this meeting and, and agreed on a couple of questions, really three of them. Um, the, the first one I would direct specifically to, to Mauricio and, and to Fernando, uh, focusing on developing countries. So I think the people, especially within the WTO, within trade law, we know that there's a lot of options out there already for developing countries to draw upon. You have the advisory center, UNCTA, the WTO, law firms who do pro bono work, the, the, the clinics. So in, in this context, why is it, and I think Buba from Nigeria, you, you, you highlighted this, why is it that even today we still have an issue of awareness, of capacity, at least in, in, in some circles, and, and to think a bit about the bottlenecks, where is it that people don't get access to that capacity that is out there, the, the supply that is out there, um, where, in what areas is the supply still lacking, and how, how best to address particular failures or, or gaps at, at, at this moment. So, Mauricio, I don't know whether you can go first from the perspective of a, a diplomat working for one of the developing country missions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jost. Thank you for this invitation. Um, I would like to start thanking, thanking you for the invitation and to participate in this event. We are very honored of such invitation and to share our experience with you. Um, maybe before tackling your, your the particular uh, question that you have made, I would say that um, we have been a beneficiary of the, of the project. Uh, we consider ourselves as a client, uh, but we have been a beneficiary of the, pro of the projects, first with the Gravity Institute and then with Georgetown. Um, the, the, in these projects, uh, we have received two very useful products uh, that have helped first to establish Colombia's negotiation, negotiating position in a very sensitive matter that is nowadays negotiated in the WTO. And second, uh, we have rece rec received a research and awareness document that is going to be published soon in the topic of uh, illicit trade and how this phenomenon can be addressed in the context of international trade law. In <clears throat> Within the interna international organizations, NGOs, and other entities that exist in Geneva to support the diplomatic interaction between states, government, and international actors, a, in our opinion, Trade Lab is starting to play a very relevant role in enhancing capacity of developing members as us to comply a, with the challenging atmosphere that a, such an interaction actually represents. A, and in this very short remarks, I, I would like to point out also that uh, in, in our opinion, uh, these groups, this, this group of NGOs, uh, universities, uh, entities, international organizations actually <coughs> uh, play the role of a safety network uh, for developing countries and for, for members in general to improve uh, their position and to advance their positions in the system. Um, in the particular case of my country, we identify ourselves a, as a developing country member, but also as a middle grounder player in the WTO. 
and we always try to operate in, in with this idea of a middle grounder and the idea to, to work and to cooperate with others in order to advance our positions in the best uh, constructive and positive uh, manner for the system. Uh, in this sense, uh, we are uh, users, common users, fre frequent users of, of different kind of resources like uh, the ACWL that uh, we help to, to establish uh, almost 17 years ago, <coughs> 17 years ago, uh, and uh, um, nowadays we have been working one year with with Trade Lab, but uh, with Trade Lab, but we have been also working with uh, other entities as the uh, ICTSD, the ITC, the ACWL. I think that uh, is, as you mentioned, there is a huge offer of services here in Geneva uh, for both developing countries and, and developed countries. And, uh, and I will say something is that in, in, some, in some sense, my, my opinion is that uh, from our perspective, the, the actually that idea of leveling the playing field has actually come true in many ways. The, nowadays you have a very important developing countries advancing very important positions and, and, and proposing a very a clever and smart a documents that actually really help to the to contribute to the to the debate and, and a, in general manners a, the advancing the, the negotiations in the WTO. Um, so that would be my, my initial remarks regarding your particular question. I think that sometimes um, members are not <coughs> fully aware of the of this uh, portfolio of services that uh, actually Geneva offers is, and this safety network, as we call it, uh, that actually we can accede in order to to have this uh, to perform and to carry out our our duties here in Geneva as a, as a mission. Um, we we are we we are frequent users of that and and sometimes we talk with our members in order to to try to 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 get those services but i think that maybe uh, sometimes people in geneva when the people arrive to geneva they are not fully aware of of this portfolio of services that is uh, quite useful for 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 a developing country to to carry out its duties so so i will end there Great, with my remarks you have, sure. um, your views on this question Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jus, for, for the invitation. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with um, uh, uh, um, Common Faces, um, uh, friends and colleagues uh, who interact with me on a daily basis. Um, I'm um, here speaking in my personal capacity. I'm not talking on behalf of the ACWL. I'm just talking from the perspective of somebody who has been dealing with developing countries and least developed countries um, in the handling of WTO disputes. Uh, and by handling of WTO disputes, I refer to the pre-litigation stage when the country has to prepare its case, or on the responding side when the country has to prepare in advance to a future challenge that may be brought against it. Um, and my perception is that, first of all, thank you. Okay. I think we have to make a distinction here between the question of legal awareness and the question of legal capacity. I think as far as legal awareness is concerned, um, I think this is a, a matter that varies across countries. There are some developing countries that are much more aware of what are the tools that are out there <coughs> to um, facilitate their work or to facilitate them, their, the enforcement of their rights in the WTO system. And it's also a question, I think, that varies across different institutions. For example, the Ministry of Trade is, is certainly uh, going to be more aware of you know, the advisory center and the WTO or the pro bono work of certain law firms than, for example, the sanitary office of the country. You know? um, and I guess this is a question that perhaps relates to a certain extent to um, it, um, human resources management. I think there are some considerations here that um, relate to the rotation of people who are in charge of these positions, who are in charge of these responsibilities. Uh, I think that is something that we face um, um, on a regular basis when we have diplomats who have been in the, in, the, in the position for, let's say, five years. They have to go back to the office. There are newcomers, 
and we have to make these people aware of what is um, available in Geneva or what could be used to help um, advance their positions in WTO dispute settlement. Um, I guess one way in which this problem could be addressed is by increasing the number of outreach activities, seminars like this, or perhaps uh, organizing on a more regular basis visits or um, meetings with the missions here in Geneva. That is something that, for example, the ACWL does uh, whenever we have the opportunity. Um, and then as far as legal capacity is concerned, uh, I think here we, have, we face a reality, and this reality goes to the fact that in some of the um, of our developing countries and least developed countries, we have a limited number of officials who can handle this matter. <laughs> and we know that, for example, we are dealing with, we have three people in the mission who have to cover certain trade negotiations. At the same time, they may have to cover intellectual property and also WTO uh, disputes. So I think this is a problem that goes to the organizational setup of the countries. I don't know to what extent we can make their work easier. Um, certainly training activities could make them more aware of what are the latest developments in terms of WTO jurisprudence. But I think there is, uh, uh, I think, a, a reality limit there. And I think I leave it there for now, and then perhaps we can Thank you. I might add, of course, and you've seen it from some of the projects uh, discussed, <coughs> that, that all of this goes way beyond dispute settlement. Some of the projects we've done deal with dispute settlement, but if anything, there's a lot more um, need in the field of negotiations, implementation, compliance. And the other trend we've seen at least, but I think it's the same um, in other places, it's not just WTO work. Um, free, trade has, uh, free trade agreements, um, investment treaties, investment dispute settlement, which I assume ACWL is there for, for WTO um, work focused on dispute settlement. But when it comes to investor state dispute settlement, there is no such thing as the ACWL. So, so we've seen also in some of the projects where developing countries want more capacity on that, or even where small businesses have a claim and they have no uh, resources to, to pay for um, uh, an expensive law firm to, to analyze the claim. So th that brings me to, to, my, to my second question, which, which moves away from uh, the capacity awareness in developing countries, but looks a bit more at, at um, NGOs, trade unions, small businesses. Uh, so, so the question there is, what has been done at the moment, or what could be done more to engage them and, and trade agreements. So ranging from when these agreements are concluded to make sure that they are involved and geos trade unions can, can voice their concerns, all the way to compliance implementation and even uh, dispute settlement. So Thea and Lisbeth and, and Scott, um, I had asked you to, to, to say a few words on, on that. Perhaps we can, we can start sure. with you, Thea. <coughs> Well, thank you, Yost, and thank you, Mengi, for the invitation to come. It's a pleasure and it's fun to learn a little bit about Trade Lab and the work that you all have been doing around the world, so that's very impressive. So uh, um, I've worked for the AFL-CIO, I have, for about 20 years, and I've represented unions at a lot of uh, international fora, WTO ministerials, World Bank IMF discussions, and also bilateral and regional trade agreement negotiations uh, between the U.S. And, and other countries where we engage not only with our own government, with the executive branch and the legislative branch, but also with our counterparts in developing countries, with the unions in, um, in, develop, in, in our trade partners and sometimes with their governments. And so it's very interesting. The unions, I'm not sure that unions are not engaged in trade discussions. We're very engaged, uh, but we have been marginalized, I think, by the sometimes by our own governments, sometimes by the trade bureaucracy, sometimes by just sort of being drowned out by the corporate voices, uh, the corporate advocates that are very um, engaged and very central to the trade negotiations. So I guess for me, part of the question is not just how do we engage or educate unions about trade negotiations, but how do we bring their voices uh, into the center stage? Um, I always remember the, the famous WTO meeting in Seattle where there were and the preparations for that, since that was hosted in the United States, we were more engaged, but there were all the different levels of uh, sponsorship. You know, there was the emerald and platinum and diamond and 
titanium, you know, and various amounts of money that were given mostly by companies uh, to be part of the festivities surrounding the WTO ministerial. There were receptions, there were dinners, there were photo opportunities, there were meetings, there were face-to-face um, -face engagement with the decision makers. And the unions, our, our joke always was, the unions and the NGOs, we're going to be maybe the tin level of, um, of engagement because we didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to put on the table to, uh, to get access to the negotiators the way a lot of other groups did. So that's, I think, just starting out a challenge. And I also um, just want to bring up one quick point. I'm going to try to touch on a million things quickly, and then we'll hopefully have time for discussion. But um, that you, we do certainly have seen over the years a difference in the access of <clears throat> developed country unions to their own government and our developing country counterparts. And so, you know, while we complain a lot in the United States, and we have a lot to complain about because, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot more corporate advisors than our union or environmental or NGO, but we do meet regularly with the U.S. Trade Reps Office. We are represented on the advisory committees. We have uh, clearance, uh, you know, confidential security clearance to see some of the ongoing negotiating. And when we talk to our union counterparts in other countries, a lot of times they would have no idea how to go to the trade minister and how to submit comments, how to be a part of the negotiation. So I think that is one of the big lacks, one of the areas where it would be, I, I think, really important for <coughs> developing country trade unionists to have in a more regular way channels of communication to their own government as well as access when the negotiations happen at the regional and the multilateral basis. But the other thing, how to make the system work better for NGOs, civil society, and unions, in my view, there is a need for technical support, but there also are obstacles, and some of the obstacles are point of view and perspective. And I think we all know it's not a secret that unions and many of the NGOs, environmental groups, consumer groups have been critical of the, um, the rules, the machinery of the global economic uh, machine. And so the question, I think one of the questions for Trade Lab is, is Trade Lab simply, you know, a provider of technical advice to a system that already exists and is set in stone, or can Trade Lab play a different role in terms of ad advising unions and NGOs how we can be more effective in impacting the, the content, the template of trade agreements and negotiations in a way that addresses some of the concerns that we've raised. So an even-handed analysis of various options I think would be useful, uh, not just tariff reduction because we've all seen a lot of the studies and we've, I've been a critic of a lot of the studies that have been done with usually overly rosy and optimistic predictions about how many zillions of jobs will be created from this trade agreement or that trade liberalization. <coughs> but often the problem is that those First of all, those analyses are often wrong. Uh, if you look at them 10 years later, they don't really have, they haven't really captured the dynamic of what's happening. But the other problem is that they're usually focused just on the tariff reduction, but not so much the proposed regulatory changes or what are the costs to consumers and the public, um, as well as the benefits to business of regulatory harmonization or coordination. The same with pharmaceutical and IP, intellectual property rights costs. Um, you know, to the extent that we look at everything from a business lens, you see higher um, intellectual property rights protections as being an unqualified good for business, but it also has an impact, of course, on consumers, particularly in developing countries. Um, when we look at labor and environmental standards, we should be looking not just what is the competitive impact on businesses and governments, but what could be the positive impact on economic growth and sustainability uh, for example, if we talk about labor rights and having enforceable labor rights in the context of our trade agreements, not using child labor or slave labor um, doesn't just raise the cost of labor to a business, but it also actually improves uh, productivity of future generations because children are not maimed or um, permanently disabled from, <coughs> from being forced to work. Not violently suppressing freedom of association allows more vibrant democ democracy to flourish and has an impact on income distribution, which also has an impact on economic growth. So I think those are some of the ways in which we don't as often take the fuller look at the impact of trade agreements. But also, um, I think, 
So in, in terms of Trade Lab and the particular role that Trade Lab has played, I think it would be interesting to think about how we might write together uh, with both North and South unions and um, NGO groups a more effective labor and environmental chapter that is uh, quicker, that, that works better, because I think that's been one of the frustrations. We have worked, especially in the United States, we've worked for 25 years to include enforceable workers' rights in trade agreements. We've had a lot of success because the, the language is much better than it used to be, and yet we still have a hard time using that language effectively. And I don't know whether it would be an appropriate role for Trade Lab to help craft you know, a, a winning case, a case that could move quickly through the system. We've had a lot of uh, disappointing and frustrating experience in the United States. Our last big case against Guatemala under the Central America Free Trade Agreement was filed, I think, nine and a half years ago and has not come to fruition at this point, even though it documented a fairly egregious set of circumstances, including murders and assassinations. So those are some of the, those are some ideas. The other idea I had was just thinking about ways in which the, the expertise and the, the energy that Trade Lab brings together could be effective is thinking about more transparency, more equitable participation in trade negotiations, both at the level of the WTO and regional bilateral agreements. I know that's been a big criticism, both in the TTIP, the TPP, and a lot of other negotiations. I think that's something that would improve both the, um, the content of agreements as well as their reception. So those are just a few quick ideas. I know we have a lot of folks on here, and I'm looking forward to the discussion and to uh, more questions. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, you. I think, Jennifer, you have a list of projects you could work on <laughs> yes. out of Georgetown uh, next year. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, Lisbeth, you, you want to add the NGO perspective to this? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much, and also thank you for the, for the invitation from Trade Lab, and let me also congratulate Joost and his whole Trade Lab team around this, because this has really been an, an, an accomplishment, and so many projects, so much knowledge that has been spread in the community that works around international economic governance and law, I think is, uh, has been really impressive. Um, the organization I work for, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, uh, has been a beneficiary of uh, tra trade lab projects back in the days. I think was still the, the law clinics at the Graduate Institute. Um, and at the same time, we also work in the area of capacity building uh, in developing countries, in particular in the economic law and policy sphere. So I think I can, I can actually uh, comment from, from those two perspectives. Um, with regards to the law clinic project that we were uh, part of, that was about five years ago uh, when uh, uh, the Canada Renewable Energy case uh, was uh, present at the, at the WTO scene and um, students from the, the Graduate Institute helped us uh, design an amicus brief that was then also submitted. Uh, and I think it was a great experience for us as an, as an NGO as well as for the students because it has given students really uh, that possibility and it has been mentioned before to work on something that is real. Um, that is applicable and that they also see that there are beneficiaries that really needed that help because I think there are a lot of civil society organizations in particular these days and in particular the ones working around climate and sustainability who are often struggling for funds to do that technical nitty-gritty work that actually students can perfectly execute and I think that's really where civil society organizations and uh, projects like Trade Lab work hand in hand because we often, I think, identify the need or the gap that there is in terms of what's the technical knowledge that we really want to bring to the table when we do policy recommendations towards developing countries or where we work uh, with, with the Canadian government, uh, with, uh, with any government these days. Um, there is more need for bringing that evidence to the table so we can make ev evidence-based based policy uh, recommendations. And there I think Trade Lab has huge potential moving forward, in particular because you're also starting to look outside the, the pure uh, WTO context, the pure uh, BIT context that we've seen. And a lot of questions I think that are being filed these days are about the broader global economic governance sphere. So I really welcome uh, the idea that that goes beyond the pure um, dispute settlement questions that hang around the WTO or that hang around uh, 
the bilateral investment treaties, I think that's uh, an incredibly important aspect. Because then if I look at the work we have been doing in many countries, we more and more get questions from government officials about all the complex issues they have to deal with nowadays. I work around public procurements. A lot of questions being filed these days around public procurement. What can we do? Because we have a lot of international economic governance, but at the same time it's domestic policy that we're still dealing with. So there are a lot of questions coming from officials of how far can we go if we want to bring in sustainability considerations in our public procurement policies, in our public procurement laws. And we often, as an NGO, um, we don't, eat, we don't have the time, we don't have the financial resources to address all those questions at once. And that's really where um, we hope to keep on working together with, uh, with Trade Lab uh, in uh, accessing some of the technical knowledge that we know the, the students have. Um, so I think that's uh, a really important part moving forward. Um, <clears throat> another thing I wanted to, to highlight is that um, the Trade Lab project, I think, has also been an inspiration for a lot of civil society organizations in looking at what are the different facilities that we can think of in assisting governments, in assisting corporations better um, with all, with actually compiling all of the data that is out there these days and putting that into a, a very concise uh, memo, a concise paper, so that those corporations, SMEs, uh, governments can actually work moving, moving forward. Um, I think that's a, that's a struggle for any type of organization, be it civil society, government, corporate. And um, we, we as, a, as an NGO have been thinking uh, around similar capacity building facilities for governments around the public procurement angle, around the infrastructure angle. How do we go about this? And I think Trade Lab has been a, has been a great inspiration there. Um, so also would like to congratulate you for that. Thank you. Scott, the business side, All small right. business. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what I'd like to focus on. Um, uh, I am the managing partner of uh, the Sidley um, Emerging Enterprises Pro Bono Program. We represent, uh, uh, in that program, about 150 different small enterprises in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, there's about 600 Sidley lawyers over the last several years who've worked on this. We work with corporate counsel uh, as well on these projects and also with local counsel uh, in these various countries. Um, the, the, the work that we do for these SMEs um, is basic legal work, um, contract related work, intellectual property, um, market access related work, um, negotiating loan agreements and investments for these companies as they grow. Um, so it's a really wide variety of business related um, work, but it also involves trade related work. Um, I would just say in terms of negotiations, none of our clients <laughs> are at the point where they have any capacity to, to negotiate or, or to be involved in the negotiation of trade agreements. Rather, their, their focus is how do they, uh, and they don't even know about the trade agreements most of the time. Um, you know, Jennifer was talking about, they don't know the right questions to ask or, or where to go, so our lawyers really, really help them. But, but having our lawyers understand that these trade agreements exist and how we can, how we can use that uh, is, is critical for their, for their benefit. These are enterprises that are just literally trying to survive uh, in a competitive environment where generally the regulatory environment is fraught with all sorts of difficulties. Um, so um, helping them uh, in the first instance understand uh, how they can gain market access. Um, market access really is the, is the, is the key for them, uh, both within their own country, regionally, and also internationally. The high value markets are in the US and the EU uh, and the northern uh, developed countries. Um, so what are the kind of trade rules that um, our lawyers and the trade lab um, uh, students need to focus on. It's, it's, it's the nuts and bolts of trade. It's rules of origin uh, related issues, technical requirements for, for packaging and labeling. SPS requirements are a huge issue for agricultural um, products. Taking advantages of trade preferences. Um, can, they, can they do that? In the um, e-commerce area, taking advantage of higher de minimis VAT customs duties. Um, intellectual property rights as well. You'd be surprised um, how much IP work we do for these SMEs uh, to get trademarks, 
and copyrights uh, for their for the products, uh, and services access as well. We represent a number of, of, of micro businesses uh, and financial institutions that are providing micro loans uh, to companies um, as well. So why is pro bono assistance necessary? I mean, there there is a big lack of capacity, um, and there are gaps. Um, SMEs certainly themselves are not aware of these international organizations or regional um, agreements or the, what their rights are. So your first instance is to say, look, here, there's an agreement here that could help you. Um, so it's identifying uh, that first. Many um, local council and regional council in these areas are not aware of these trade agreements. Um, that's been our experience anyway. So working with local council, we can educate the local council and give them capacity to, um, to understand the existence of these agreements and then help them uh, use them. Um, many national and um, regional governments themselves lack the capacity to assist SMEs. Um, in fact, it, it's, it's quite the contrary in some cases in terms of you know, corruption problems. Um, so many, many times these, these enterprises are just trying to survive uh, in that environment. And there's a lack of resources at international organizations. I mean, we've been talking here today a lot about governments, but nobody's talking about SMEs. These are the real users of these agreements that we're all talking about here. So let's keep, your, let's keep our eye on the ball. <laughs> and the ball really is these small companies which provide over half of the employment for, for many developing countries. Um, and I, in terms of the government, I have to, I have to quote my, my friend, uh, Roberto Azevedo, who said, governments are not thinking about the small and medium enterprises. They say they are. They think they are, but they're not because they don't know what the problems are that SMEs face. So um, I would really encourage uh, uh, Trade Lab to move from 6% of the work for SMEs to bring that up to about 25 or 30 percent, and we're happy to work with you uh, to do that. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. No, and uh, really, really useful. And um, I think we can build on that in, in the future. So I, I want to use the. Um, the, the last question for, for a more regional assessment. Uh, James and, and Said, you've been involved in one shape or another in the project. I think we can talk generically about capacity <coughs> awareness challenges, but we all know there's, there's regional differences. And, and I just wanted James to say a few words about the situation in Africa, and then Said, who, who knows a lot about the, the Middle East. Thank you, Just. Uh, like Just has said, my name is James Nguira. I'm from uh, Trade Policy Training Center in Africa, in short known as TRAPCA. We do capacity building in trade policy and trade law. We have a master's degree in uh, international trade policy and trade law, which is accredited by Lund University of Sweden. And I have uh, my academic director sitting at the back, Hans Falk. Um, over the years that we have been working in this area, there are a couple of challenges that we've noted uh, relating to uh, trade in Africa. First, one thing that you'll see is that although most African countries are members of the WTO, you'll find that very few of them have domesticated the obligations that have taken on board. And related to that, you also find not only about WTO, but even some of the regional trade agreements which they themselves have signed up to. You don't have legislation that will enable them to implement that. In addition to that, you find that these are not mainstreamed in the national policies. And instead, it is looked at as this is the preserve of the Minister of Trade. In the process, you find that key implementing agencies, like uh, Fernando was saying, you find uh, that those that are dealing with SPS issues, they are not part and parcel of the process. So even if they go for negotiations, they will not have right people backstopping the Minister of Trade because they don't have these people being involved. Now, in the process, you find that capacity that is being built is mainly for Minister of Trade and not the relevant implementing agencies. So th that's one major challenge. You also find, unlike maybe what happens in other countries, the private sector are not really involved to give in some inputs into some of the positions that governments will take when they are negotiating some of these agreements. And so in the process, you also find that there's lack of capacity in the private sector other than the fact that they are not being involved. Now, you, you find that, therefore, this raises a big challenge in terms of uh, having the right capacity in, 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 these, in these countries. And um, related to that, you also find that in Africa, international economic law training is expensive. 
and there are very few African universities that are doing capacity building in international economic law. And I think from our experience as TRAPCA in a small way, we've been making contributions that have helped not only in raising awareness about international economic law issues, but also building the requisite capacity. Because, and, and that's one of the reasons why we took a long-term capacity building approach, rather than the short-term training, because we know there are so many institutions that are into that. Now, every two years when we, we do our trainings, we do what is called a tracer survey. We go and follow our students. We go and uh, ask questions uh, to their employers. And this is done by ind independent firms. And increasingly, we get to feedback to say that the students that we're training, they are giving the right support maybe to their uh, technical group that is involved in negotiation. Increasingly, you find that in a particular country, you find among the negotiating team, there's someone who has been to Trapka. So in that way, but this is not enough, because we deal in both Francophone and Anglophone Africa. And you find that maybe in Francophone Africa, the capacity issues are even huge as compared to the uh, Anglophone. Now, for us being part of a trade lab, I think we, it gives us another avenue for not only raising awareness, but also building capacity. I think for the uh, two to three years that we've been working with the Georgetown and Graduate Institute, one thing that we've seen is that it has helped us to build specific capacities not only in the students that are involved, because these are students that are learning now by doing, because they deal with real life issues, but the, we are also able to talk to governments, we're able to talk to uh, real uh, clients, and they'll be able to implement this. And good thing is that, you know, because these are real issues, which you find that this African country will also identify with those particular problems these are things that can easily be implemented and these can be replicated. So we're seeing that this also is to an extent going to help in uh, improving the structural challenges that are there if we are to look at it from the perspective of dispute settlement. You find in most African countries, in their ministries of justice, very few of them will have lawyers that are given the docket that they are the ones that are going to deal with trade-related disputes. So in the long, in the long run, what we are seeing is that since a good number of the students that are being involved are lawyers and that therefore their countries know that this is someone that has been working in this area, we are looking at it that this is also one of the areas where we would be able to have African countries have some capacity in terms of having in their Ministry of Justice people that have the knowledge and they can easily understand where to start from when they have a, dis a dispute related issue on trade. I think maybe let me stop from there. Great. And I, I must say one of the favorite projects I've worked on was the one we worked on together this semester for, for South Sudan, who had acceded to the East African community, but hadn't really realized what that implies and how to implement this even at the, the level of, of customs. So, and for the Georgetown students to work with students from that region uh, and to realize, you know, how difficult it was even to get an internet connection or get to talk to each other or get the documents, the, the South Sudan domestic law. Said, perhaps a few words on, on the Middle East. I know that that's your focus. Thanks very much, Just, and uh, um, thanks to your team too, and Mengi, for, for inviting me. I, I have three hats in this meeting, so I prefer to speak in my personal capacity. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a WTO official, but I used to be a, a delegate from my country. I come from Morocco, North Africa. But I'm also doing a PhD study here in, uh, in the Graduate Institute. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in this region for different reasons, um, particularly because historically um, and culturally, trade has been a very strong component of the Arab culture, yet the influence uh, of these countries on, on international trade and in WTO is, is very, very low. One of my friends, uh, an academic from Jordan called uh, Riyad Al Khouri, uh, has a paper, it's on the WTO website, and he says in the Arab world, the WTO is at best a complicated irrelevance and at worst a sinister organization. So this is where we are starting in this region. So the global context is quite difficult. Uh, some might say even there's uh, some uh, 
uh, anti-globalization stream in Arab society is that blocks a little bit the interest in, in the WTO. But come from my experience as a delegate working for a minister of trade for a couple of years, the WTO is a very low priority compared to free trade agreements, for example. So it is not really on the radar screen of, of, of political deciding factors. That's, I think, key in terms of what Fernando was saying about uh, legal awareness even. Uh, they, they don't consider this as, a, as an organization that is useful for them. Well, luckily, probably this is starting to change very, very slowly. For, and I will take two examples. I don't want to be very long. Two examples from two countries. One latecomer, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and my own country, Morocco, who actually convened the Marrakesh uh, conference, which created the WTO. And uh, I was there then working for the, for the Ministry of Trade. And we were very enthusiastic. And I think we, uh, as a country, submitted one of the first amicus curiae on the sardine case. So I was very young then, and I thought, oh, this is great. We will probably use the system. But after that, all of this just went, you know, nothing since then. Um, and only this year, we are now in a case as a respondent uh, to, to Turkey. So this is like a shock therapy. And I can tell you, uh, a week ago I was in Morocco. Uh, I usually go there. I, 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 you know, I have a lot of friends, so they talk about the WTO a little bit. But now everybody wanted to talk about the WTO. What can we do? And I said, listen, this thing would have happened one day, and it happened today. And I, I think one of the interesting things that uh, came out from these discussions is they were expecting the cases to come from the EU or from the US because they are the biggest partners. They are the ones where they have all this relation, and they think, well, w this is where we can solve this through other solutions. Um, but this came from Turkey, another developing country. And it's very interesting in the Arab countries, I'm limiting myself to Arab countries, 13 of them are in the WTO. Um, they, their use of the WTO dispute settlement taken together is less than the use that Turkey has done. None of them has been a complainer, none. And only Egypt and Morocco were respondent in a few cases. Morocco, this is the first time in 2017, and I think Egypt about four. So it is not really uh, 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 something big on their radar screen. This, however, my second example is from Saudi Arabia, a latecomer to the system, but I think this is the only example where you have a country that is starting to really take things maybe seriously. Why I'm saying this? This is the only Arab country that has a dedicated embassy or, or mission, so to speak, to the WTO. That's the only one. Um, secondly, they have an ambassador who, was, who is now, who used to be in the team that negotiated the accession to Saudi Arabia. So somebody who knows a little bit what he's talking about. Third they have dramatically increased their involvement with the dispute settlement. So they went from zero to about to being, albeit just a third party, to 32 cases. Um, and fourth, they also uh, hired a law firm to work seriously uh, on this, on both the legal awareness but the legal capacity. Um, so that's an example, I think, which will probably uh, give some results because in the Arab group, everybody is now I talk to is thinking about this Saudi uh, kind of seriousness about the system. Why are they doing this? So the Qataris are thinking about it. Uh, you remember when we talked about the Trade Lab launch in, in Qatar, we talked to the uh, Emirates, to Qatar, to many others, and they all said, we want our Trade Lab, <laughs> if you remember that discussion. So, th so the need is there, uh, uh, at least from the Geneva crowd. In the capitals, it's a different story. And I think in the case of Morocco, the shock therapy of the Turkey case is a good in a sense because it gives uh, these people to, to, uh, to, to be serious about this. Structurally, the difficulties, I think, in terms of capacity are the same. Um, there's a com some sense of a competing priority with other trade negotiations. 
uh, and also the fact that overall political discussions take center stage uh, in many countries. Um, second difficulty and weakness is that Ministry of Trade, who handles these issues, is not the strongest of institutions in the government. Uh, so they lack a bit of leverage to, to push. Thirdly, missions, and my friend from Nigeria, we had a lot of time discuss this, uh, all the missions in African uh, countries or Arab countries are notoriously weak in terms of human resources. So we have one guy dealing with a zillion of, of meetings, so difficult. And the second thing they will tell you, we don't get any instructions from capital on anything. So you have to you know, improvise. Um, another, I think, key thing uh, is uh, the fact that education in international trade law is also very, very low in these countries. At least some uh, countries that I had the chance to talk to and the one I know in Morocco, uh, it's it, it just starting, it's very late that these countries started to have, for example, master degrees in international trade or in the WTO. So you don't have a base where you can build you know, capacity on, on these issues, and that's a very serious flaw. It's starting to be adjusted. I know, for example, uh, and that's my, uh, my last point, on the things that we can do as a WTO or also other countries. Um, in the WTO, we have a program called the WTO Chairs Program. I don't know if somebody, some of you might, might be aware. But since we don't have a, a presence on the ground, one of the ideas, which is a great idea, uh, is uh, to have this network of universities with a WTO chair. So we help them in the first years with some money, we help them also on, on the uh, courses. Uh, and, and things like that. And they have also a platform of cooperation with other universities. There are now about 90 universities spread across the globe, Latin America, Africa. Uh, uh, and many of those have actually developed master degrees in, in WTO law, which is a great thing. Um, and I think one of the ideas might be for the Trade Lab to be involved in some way or, or, or the other with this program and probably maybe with the advisory board, because we have an advisory board on this chairs program. I think that's, that's something that maybe we, we, uh, we might think about it, either through the trade lab or maybe the universities that work with the trade lab. It's, it's maybe an idea. Uh, the other thing we, we could do, because I, I heard a lot about the non-state actors, and that's something really important uh, uh, for, for the WTO. Uh, be it on, on the trade dialogue that we started. Um, trade unions were there because we know we have to balance things. Uh, it's very important. In the public forum, we always have that balance. Um, but one thing we, we could do is uh, uh, we have something called the Introduction Week to the WTO. New delegates to Geneva, we do this for them. One feature would be to tell them all, all the things that Fernando said about the uh, the, or also Mauricio about the safety net kind of tools that are available or maybe survival kit for the delegate, the lonely delegate <laughs> in a very small <laughs> mission. So that's something we can, we can put also on, on that program, introduce them uh, and say this is an offer, try to use it. Um, the third thing, and I'll finish with that, uh, something that I have the, uh, the privilege to, to conduct in the WTO is the outreach program of the WTO to uh, parliamentarians to <coughs> NGOs. Uh, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of resources, but we try to do at least five to six activities on a regional basis. I think it's, uh, and, I, and this is something I will implement, definitely, is, is probably to have the, the Trade Lab uh, or TRAPCA or, or ECWL, provided they have, a, uh, they have a, a time with these activities to spread the good word, to say these solutions are there, don't get scared, you know, you can use the system. Uh, and, and, and in these countries, I think it, it can make uh, a big, a big, big difference. I'll finish just with an anecdote about ACWL and Morocco. Uh, one of the things to know that this is very low in terms of uh, uh, radar screen of politicians in Morocco. When they have the case with Turkey, they realize or somebody told them that the ACWL exists actually. No members. They were not. Mm -hmm. So they came in, and then so Fernando and his team told them you have to pay and become a member. 
So they become members. The second question, of course, said, oh, we have this case with Turkey. And ECW said, oh, sorry, Turkey came first. <laughs> so, you know, you learned the hard way. So the shock therapy maybe is a good one. Let me finish here. <laughs> OK, thank you, Said, and, and thank you to all seven of you for, for sharing your insights. And I know we didn't have a lot of time. We are a bit over. We, we have coffee outside. I suggest um, we continue the discussion there. Um, Unless there's people in the audience here who have a, a specific question or wanted to contribute something. Um, yes, Buba, anyone else? You can take a, yes, Farzan. And then we can move on for Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, Nigeria has benefited from this clinic because uh, we have an issue in the TRIMS committee that is on our legislation. But I think more importantly, the issue of domestication that was raised by our Trapka colleague, I think is very important because having an international agreement or WTO law, that is not helpful if you did not implement it because it's as good as nothing. For SMEs, I don't know because there has been discussions. What really does the SMEs want? And I think there is a need for us to have a clinic trying to look at that. Are we trying to come up with a discipline in the WTO in order to help SMEs? Are the M SMEs trying to use the existing WTO architecture? So I think these are issues that we need to look at. Going back to the DSU negotiations, of course, the Africa Group, we did submit a proposal way back in 2002, which is on compliance. And it is something we have been pushing for these negotiations. Up till now, it appears nothing has happened. And of course, even where you have won a dispute and the other party refused to comply and you don't have capacity to induce compliance by withdrawing concessions, that is a big issue. We have come up with something, it has not worked in the negotiations and I believe the clinic could be maybe one avenue perhaps trying to look at it because we were looking at the issue of collective retaliation as is being used in the, in the, in the United Nations apparently are looking at nullification and impairment of obligations. So I think it is something that perhaps if we could be helped as Africa group. So maybe perhaps we will have to talk, either our coordinator will have to write or I don't know, but we'll uh, do the discussion. Great, and let's end with the student, why not? Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Parham. I'm a PhD student at the Graduate Institute doing international law. Thank you very much to everybody, to CTI, to Trade Lab, to everyone, to all the participants. Very insightful. Uh, I would have a question for Mr. Uh, Said El Hashimi, if I may. So, well, see, uh, when you when we look at the map of the world and we see that the uh, non-members of the of the WTO or observers that part of the world is somehow quite identical to the same place where terrorism and security stuff like that also come out. Do you think, of, or, um, or if, do you have any sort of reflection on this, and do you think that trade can be, or an, an, an inclusive trade can be a solution also for peace, and how would us students, researchers, or trade lab would contribute to, to a sort of trade for peace? in general. Yes. Hello, I'd just like to take the floor for one minute to say hello to everyone who's listening in on our live streaming. Thank you for being with us. And if you have questions you can't put, you can, of course, send them to Professor Powellin, to me, to our coordinators, or to info at tradelab.org. Thanks for being with us, and thanks for everyone in the room. We're not quite done. That was a tough one. Huh? That, that's a tough one. I don't know how, even in my personal capacity, that's a tough one to answer. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we're living in very difficult times in the region, and uh, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, tired of uh, discussing those uh, um, uh, issues because you, you look to the news, you, you, you get a depression, <laughs> especially if you come from that region. Uh, uh, you have Libya, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, you know, um, it's 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 very hard to to uh, to envisage. I think trade sol trade solution uh, for 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 that. I think there's a political factor that needs to be settled. We have an example now, even in when inside one uh, experience, the GCC, you know, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which used to be told to, to us as an example of where Arabs uh, got their act together and have a kind of a good integration experience. Uh, even there, you have other, you know, issues coming uh, forward that have uh, that might have an impact on the integration of that that uh, only uh, successful solution. So I, I don't have an answer to that. And uh, I think, in terms of priorities, political stability comes first. We need to to get to that uh, uh, Syrian problem. I think is a priority. It needs to be settled, uh, and then. Uh, uh, the other issue remains, of course, the Palestinian issue. I think it's very important. And uh, then maybe there's a trickle-down effect. And I'm, I'm going a bit beyond my remit as a trade official. Mm -hmm. But I think political stability is key. Then you can envisage, uh, uh, you know, uh, integration and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, economic prosperity to respond to the real fact, the real problem there is this is the region with the highest youth unemployment in the world. So that's, that's the key in the, you know, problem there. And I don't see any will to, to solve it. So let me stop. <laughs> Maybe we can, we can discuss later. Okay, let me at least end on a slightly happier note. Yeah, to definitely. Lighten Anything. Up the, uh, <laughs> But it, it is a, it's a, an interesting question you have, and we hope to be able to work at least on, on some of some projects related to, to that challenge. So thank you so much for everyone who is with us, who is on the roundtable speaking, Mengi for organizing it, Teresa, Angelica, uh, for people with us online. So keep the projects coming. We will try our best uh, to, to service all of them. And um, thanks also to the people in the audience for, for being here and, and sharing this moment with us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>